Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. You know, uh, singing that song, I always think about the, the word hallelujah. Um, hallelujah, I don't know if, if, if anyone or everyone knows what that means, but it means praise to Yah or praise to Yahweh. So I always kind of hear that like when I sing hallelujah, because that's like the name of the Lord in the Old Testament. And I uh, just want to share this as well. Uh, the devotionals this morning, ladies, thank you so much. That really, really spoke to me. And so my name is Tony Espinosa. And uh, my daughter, Jude, some of you may know already. She's here on the staff. <laughs> and we brought Chloe as well. Yeah, I'd like to say, you know, greetings from Nashville, Tennessee. Now, there are other Nashvilles in the United States, uh, but we're at the one in Tennessee. And I just want to say this. There's more to Nashville than country music. Yes. There's more to Nashville than country music. Like Taylor Swift. <laughs> So, oh, so we actually live in a, an area in North Nashville, which is called Goodlettsville. Isn't that a cute name? Goodlettsville. It's the only Goodlettsville in the United States. And uh, Nashville is a really cool town. You know, you can ask Philip, you can ask Jude, Chloe, anyone that's lived there. Uh, my friends tease me and say, you should run for the mayor of like Nashville. Like, I love it that much. But you may find it interesting to know I actually grew up in the state of Kansas. Is there others? Oh, cool. <laughs> that does not happen that often. Usually when I, I say that, I'm gonna be honest with you. When I say that, I, we used to live in the New Jersey area. It was like the best joke I never told. I would say in the tri-state area, which is New Jersey, New York, and where else? Who's ever lived there? I forgot the other state. Help me. New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. I don't know if that's any other state. <laughs> anyway, when I used to live there, we lived there about three years in the tri-state area. I don't know what the other state is. In the tri-state area of New York, I would say, I'm from Kansas. And it was literally like telling a joke. And you know what would follow, right? What would follow was, well, how's Toto? You know, <laughs> you know things like that. Hey, we're at? We're at? Yeah. Oh, this will be really funny to people from New York. I grew up in Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> so that's where I grew up, in Kansas. I, I want to share that with you just because we don't really know each other. You know, and as we're getting to know each other, this may be, this may be one of the only times that we'll ever communicate with, with one another in this life. I mean, it's interesting how life works. Uh, there's a strong possibility that you will never hear from me again. And some of you may say at the end of this, well, I'm glad. You know, no, I hope that's not the case because what we want to do is we want to hear from the Lord. And I will tell you that my daughter Jude and Chloe, you know, I can't you know, move past this point without saying that I think very highly of them and their walks with the Lord really blesses me as a father. And to introduce you to myself just a little bit more, I have some slides. Were we able to get those slides up yet, Calvin? Are we good? Okay, if you can see this slide. This is when I was younger. Now, what I want to share with all of you before we get into the message is that um, I have served as a youth pastor uh, three different times in a couple of different churches. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with college students, love to work with college students, and so I've always spent a lot of time with youth. And as you look at this church, there's a, or actually at this picture, that was my first youth group. And there's a very good chance that you can't recognize me. Like this is many years ago. And I put on there when I was younger but still old because I was younger, but quite frankly, I'm still, I was still much older than most of you, right? And so when you look at this, you probably can't see me, but I have put some helps on the next slide. Would you go to the next slide? Okay. So there's a picture of me about, I don't want to tell you how many years ago. And then in the middle there is the love of my life at the bottom of that heart. Yes. <laughs> and she is my number one love outside of the Lord. And her name is Cheryl. So we were with that youth group. We were at Eureka Springs. This was our uh, youth group in, in Kansas City. And if you move past this to the next slide, Calvin, there's a picture of me. And you will notice, you probably can't see it from a distance. That's me with my senior pastor, Bob Cave, who's from Los Angeles. He is in the front. I'm behind him. And I'm trying to block someone. And I have on the, the, the Chuck Taylors that I'm seeing in the front row with some people, the Converse. I've been religiously wearing these since I was 14 have them on today. 
You'll notice those in the picture. I just want to make mention of that. But anyway, as you look at this, uh, that is moments before my senior pastor and I were kicked off the course. Like just my wife, Cheryl, took a picture of this. And then within seconds, what happened is someone said, you two off. You know, we had to pull off. Now, we were trying to block the other students that were with us, right? And so I say all that to say, Cheryl absolutely hates this picture. Like, she hated that moment. But for some reason, I get a kick out of it. Like, when I remember that moment, I just like it. And so, about you guys. Okay, we're going to talk about you guys. We're going to talk about the Lord. And each of you, you know, you're here at On the Edge for a lot of reasons, okay? There's a lot of different reasons. And listening to the devos or the devotionals this morning, you know, clearly you all are coming from your own set of circumstances. And what's really neat about the Lord, what's really special about the Lord, is that he gets it. You're here for a lot of different reasons. He can manage to a lot of those different reasons because you're all very different people. You're in different places in your life. Um, and the Lord is quite capable of meeting us where we are, but we must be willing to be open and to be vulnerable to him when he pursues. You know, so something I want to share with you just as we get into the word and how I feel about the word of God. I'm telling you right now, some of you out there are like, I'm not sure how I feel about all this yet. I'm going to tell you that one day, if you will continue to pursue the Lord and you will really go hard after him, what's going to happen is that Bible that you're holding and you're kind of flipping through, that Bible is going to become something extremely special to you. I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about someone you really like and you would like to know more about. What if there was a book that big about that person? It was like, man, I really like her. Or I really like him. I'd love to know everything there is about him or her. And then with all of us, God has said, well, here's everything about me that you would want to know that I think we should put in words for mankind. That's a pretty cool thing. And so the more you spend time with the Lord, the more you spend time pursuing him, what's going to happen is these things are going to become pretty much like the words of life to you because he will communicate to you through these words. And I'll give you a story. This is the way God is, okay? In the beginning, you may remember there was a couple. Their names? And that couple were in a garden, and they were tempted, and they made a mistake. One of the saddest things that I ever read in the Bible happens in those first couple of chapters of Genesis, and it's these words, God saying, where are you? Where are you? We used to walk together. We used to commune together, but I can't find you. Now, I tell you this because this is what God has been doing with all of you since the day you were born. Actually, since the very beginning, he has been pursuing you. And as you go through the Bible, he has been pursuing mankind from the very beginning, going so after us, coming after us, that at some point he said, well, I'm going to send my only son. I'm going to send my son to go down and commune with them, be with them, give his life for them because I'm going to get them back. And so all those songs that we've talked about is about God's pursuit. We sang about earlier. And there's a quote I want to share with you. And before I share it, one writer in the Bible says, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It is the discern discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. And another guy from the fourth century, he was, his name was St. Ambrose, he said this, as in paradise, God walks in the Holy Scriptures seeking man. And he does that. Like when you open the Bible, he's like seeking you. So when you open your Bible, you spend time in it, and you think about it this way. And, and as we're going to go to the Bible now, let's spend a few minutes together in the Scriptures and see if we can find God, you know, finding us. Let's all pray together. Hey, would you stand with me if you can? So let's pray. Father, we just come before you um, where we are. We come before you, Lord, in our walk in faith. At some place along that continuum, 
Some of us have relationships with you that are distant. Some of us have relationships with you that are more intimate. We're all just trying to get closer to you at that, that end of the continuum. But Father, as we come to you now, I just pray a special prayer that anything that I would say, Father, that is not from you would be forgotten. And Father, that as, as Peter encouraged us, that the oracles of God would flow through us, that your word, Father, would flow in such a way that it would bring glory to you in what you're wanting. And Father, in a very personal way as we come to you now, we think about where we are with you or maybe where we're not with you and where we need to be when it comes to our faith and really trusting you. So right now as we stand before you, Father, our heads bowed, are really just a part of our worship to you saying, speak to us. As you see our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're inviting you, we're asking you together as friends to speak to us in the few minutes we have together. It's in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 18. And as we think about where we are with God where we're not, where we want to be, in these verses, we have an example of something that's going to help us as we're thinking about our faith. Again, Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Sorry, John chapter 18. Great students. No, no, sorry. Luke chapter 18. I just want to make sure you're awake. That was planned. That is not true. And if you get to John chapter 18, and it's actually, or Luke chapter 18, and it's actually John, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Did we find it about a certain young ruler? Are we there? Thank you. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. This young man had done a lot of things right, hadn't he? He's come to God. He's come to Jesus, who's the right source for finding eternal life. He claims to have been obedient to the commandments. He's doing what God has told him to do. He's kept the commandments even since he was very young. And he believes he's followed these his whole life. So as he's coming to the Lord asking about eternal life, he believes he's followed these things his whole life. And if this young, successful person was going to receive treasure in heaven, Jesus is saying, you're going to need to give up the treasure you have on earth, this thing that is your riches. And a key word in verse 18, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom, is an important piece. I. What shall I do to inherit the kingdom and to inherit eternal life? You see, there are things each of us need to know about ourselves. What is it that Jesus is wanting you to give up? What is he wanting you to change? What is he wanting you to trust him in to fully enjoy the kind of treasure that is built up in heaven? And you see, Jesus was asked this by others, right? How do I receive eternal life? One time he was asked the same question about this from a lawyer. And Jesus' response was different for that man. He told him that he needed to love the Lord God in all his heart, soul, and mind and love his neighbor as himself. So when it came to this guy and his earthly riches that needed to go, Jesus knew that his riches represented something that he could not let go of to follow him and put all of his trust in heavenly treasure instead of trusting the earthly treasure. Now, I want to be very specific. And I'm going to do my best, Aaron, to stay at this mic. I tend to be a walker, so I'm, I'm going to work on that. And just because I see a video, because yeah. <laughs> I want somebody to have to chase me. But when you look at faith, 
there is a first most important step. And what do you think that is when it comes to faith? It's putting your belief in Jesus Christ, right? So there is something that was said by a fellow by the name of Hanley. Placing faith in Christ is our side of union with Christ. And you may remember when Jesus said in John 3, 16, that to inherit eternal life, you must put your belief in him, right? And so when you're looking at your faith, my personal faith, and you're thinking about yourself, there are really three areas that are a part of faith. Now, in the Bible, you know, theologians use these big words, you know, things like biblical themes, things of that nature. These three areas tend to be belief, which is the number one thing. The number two thing is loyalty. And when we say loyalty, it's like loyalty to a spouse or faithfulness to your spouse, right? So the first most important thing is that everyone in this room, and I know from the On the Edge staff, that would be the step the On the Edge staff would want is that you put your belief in Jesus Christ and watch and see what he will do, right? Mm -hmm. But the second piece is loyalty, walking in loyalty and faithfulness to the Lord, kind of like with your friends. You know, you have friends that have broken that loyalty. How does that feel? Mm -hmm. It feels really bad, right? It feels, and that's why the Lord at, at several points says it's like adultery with him, like when you're disloyal to him, okay? But now, we want to talk about this morning the most Difficult and challenging part of faith, and it's trusting him. It's trusting God, really trusting God. We spoke earlier, right, about M and what she's going through. Can you think about what she may be thinking about when it comes to trusting God and what's happened in her family, right? This trusting thing is one of the most challenging parts of faith, but when you will fully trust God. I'm telling you, your faith will just completely come alive. It will completely come alive. And Jesus is basically taking this young man down that step, down this path, and there is something missing in this young person. It doesn't say it in these verses. This guy was a young guy, and he knew God, or he was following God from the beginning, trying to do all the right things, and now he comes to the Lord and says, I want to in inherit eternal life. And when he asked, Jesus said, there's something you've got to get rid of, and you've got to trust me with that. But I believe this is the hardest part of placing one's faith, trusting God. And we talked a little bit about what it takes to trust friends, to trust others, to trust politicians. Like when you turn on the television, where's your trust factor there? There's, a, there's kind of a lack of trust. I mean, we look at earthly leaders. We look at things, you know, that the people that are running businesses that fail, things of that nature, and the things they've done. It may be tough to trust people. But if we, if we hear one thing today, Jesus, our Father in heaven, our God is a Father you can trust. You can trust him. Trust is what makes a person's faith explode. It transforms a life into something amazing, and I can't say that enough. Just believing, just believing Jesus is a good idea, and yes, I need him to save me, he wants you to go so much farther, so much farther. So in the book, I'm going to read something to you from Follow Me. Jan Hedega said the following, if I, and, and as you listen to what I'm going to read to you, I want to challenge you to think about this list with you, Okay. If I were to put myself in the skin of a Christian who believes in Jesus but doesn't really follow him, what would my life look like? What would I experience? These are the things he threw out there. I would be cynical about church and the possibility of the Christian life actually working. I would cover the fact that I was spiritually empty, dry, and unsatisfied. I would tend to be passive and apathetic. I would have good intentions, but I would lack follow-through. I'd be focused on myself, my needs, my rights, my options. I'd prefer to be a spectator, watching, listening, but not really participating. You know, I'd subdivide my life so that I could move from one sealed compartment to another, keeping each strictly separate. There's the church world, the friends world, you know, the work world. Keep them separate, right? I'd go through the motions, doing what is expected more out of habit than anything else. 
I would be spiritually sterile, barren, and non-productive in witness and not be troubled about it. Have you ever felt these ways? Even after you put your faith in the Lord? I'd experience the frustration of trying to have the best of both worlds, attempting to serve two masters, Jesus and someone or something else, right? I'd pride myself on my ability to be independent and self-sufficient. I would keep my options open and remain uncommitted in order to avoid getting tied down. I'd have little or no sense of overriding spiritual purpose or cause. I'd prefer to drift. And then this is the part, this last thing that we should all really listen to, including me, because these things can slip into our lives. If I just believed that I wasn't really following, wasn't really trusting, I might cover up a quiet desperation inside saying to myself, there's got to be more to the Christian life than this powerless state that I'm experiencing. So let me, let me express something to you. I like to work with young people because I had a lot of problems as a young person. I'm just going to admit it. Okay. When I was about 13 or so, I had a youth pastor that would not stop with me. His name was Larry Klutz. How's that for a last name? Larry really used that name <laughs> just to have fun with us. But for whatever reason, this guy would not stop coming after me. I'd blow him off. And you know how he'd get to meet with me? I'm sure you've done this. He'd be like, hey, Tony, let's have lunch. I'm telling you, food brings people to events. So he knew that food was kind of like my thing, right? So he'd invite me, hey, let's go get breakfast. Let's go have lunch. Oh, OK. You know, so I went. And I went long enough that I realized Jesus was a great idea for me. But here was the problem. I put my faith in him, and then I went absolutely nowhere. You fast forward five or six years down the road, my heart, and you, may, you know what I'm going to, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. My heart was hard as a rock. Any of you feel that way? You don't have to raise your hands. But my heart was like hard as a rock. And man, I got stubborn. I knew Jesus was a good idea, but I got interested in things that were so outside of what he wanted for my life. I wasn't reading my Bible, you know. I wasn't doing anything to pursue him. I wasn't talking to him. If somebody said to me, hey, are you a Christian? I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. I was such a powerless, useless state. So fast forward now to I'm about 19 years old. I run into Cheryl, the love of my life. I showed you the small picture that you can see her. I run into her at a bar, and we sit down. You know, I'm out doing stuff I shouldn't be doing, the drinking stuff that we talked about in the Devo, things like that. It's like I'm out, and I run into her, and we sit down. And it's like, hey, let's go talk uh, at our friend Sherry's house. We had a mutual friend. And so we had that, you know, that romantic first conversation, right? It goes on for hours. You know, you hear that all the time. It's like, oh, we met. We couldn't stop talking. And we talked for hours and hours and hours. And so while we're visiting, it's about three hours into it. And she looks at me. She says, just out of nowhere. She's like, I just got a question for you. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she says, how do you, a question about the fact that you call yourself a Christian? But like, how do you live the way you live and, and call yourself a Christian? Like, that was her question. It's our first date. And now you can imagine me. Oh, I went through the whole, you know, well, the reason I can call myself a Christian is I believe this. And yes, I do these things, but I believe it. I tried to justify for 30 minutes. But she's asking me, how can you call yourself a Christian and live the way you live? That's probably when I should have known she was right for me, right? <laughs> so, so fast forward. OK, she's not a Christian. She didn't go to church her whole life, basically. And so fast forward, my mother's singing at an Easter service, and she's doing her standard, well, if I can get Tony and Cheryl to church, I'll ask them to come hear me sing, you know, that kind of move to try to get us to come to church. So she asked me, she's like, son, I'm singing on Sunday. I'd love for you guys to come. So Cheryl and I are like, okay, we'll, we'll go, you know. Neither of us are following the Lord, so we go, and I'm sitting there during the service, you know, arms crossed. You've all been there, hard as a rock. I'm there for my mother, but man, I'm not having anything to do with this, even though I call myself a Christian. Isn't that odd? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm standing there with my arms crossed, and 
I can, I can, they're singing an old psalm called, it's Psalm 3-3, uh, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, you're the glory, you're the lifter of my head. And I can still hear the voices around me. It was surreal. So I have my non-Christian wife next to me. I'm standing there. And as I'm standing there, if there were ever audible words I heard from the Lord, it was, you're going to be reconciled to me today. I'm like, you know, suddenly you get soft, you know, <laughs> you're like freaked out, you know. And so now I'm thinking, I've got to tell Cheryl, I'm, this happened. And so I'm kind of through the service thinking, what am I going to do? What do I need to change? And so then at the end, Pastor Gary gets up and says, does anybody want to give their life to the Lord? Unbeknownst to me, Cheryl's made a decision to give her life to the Lord. <laughs> so I was like, that's really cool, right? <laughs> so that day, I'm reconciled to him. That day, Cheryl gives her life to the Lord. But prior to that, I was all those things. It was a powerless life, right? And, and many of you have lived that, or you may be living it. If we move on in Luke 18, verse 23... When the boy or the young man heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? I mean, we are told in other gospels, some, some things about this young ruler. He was sad, and he walked away. He just, he just walked away. He was sad. There's another really special thing that's said as well, is that, I, I believe it was Mark, Mark's version, it said, Jesus loved him right before he walked away. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. That's sweet. God is sweet, okay? And when we think about our lives, I mean, is there anything, any dream, anything you have that's you, that it would be hard to part with if God said, I want you to part with it to follow me? Because that thing has become an idol in your life. The young man could not give up on the things that came with riches. Perhaps his financial achievements represented things that became idols in his life. Maybe he was unwilling to submit, subject his dreams, his identity his being in charge, you know, I'm somebody that's in charge and important in the community. If I give up all these riches, I mean, think about, think about someone like, you think about people in this world, I won't mention any names. <laughs> if they gave up all their money and their name on a tower or whatever it may be, and there's no, you know where I'm going, so. But you know, somebody like that, but if they, their identity is so wrapped up, right, in so many things like that, in this little small community, to scale, it could have been something like that. You know, it could be Bill Gates, it could be Trump, it could be anybody like that saying, I want you literally to make no sense to anybody that knows you and to just give up that business, give up those riches. You've always thought you were this, 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 and this, but I want you to just walk away. And when your whole family looks at you and says, what are you doing? I mean, have you lost your mind? That's what he would have faced, right? Now, there are some strongholds that we have that we're going to look at. And we don't have a lot more time together. So in this small time we have, if you can stay with me, these strongholds are big. These strongholds are things that literally keep us from trusting you, me, from trusting God. And there are people who won't follow God because they trust themselves, their own natural talents, most of it rooted in pride. And they have things like my intellect, Calvin, if you go to that. My intellect makes me an exception to trusting God. Instead, I tend to trust myself. Excellent memory, cleverness, great sarcasm, quickness, brilliant deductive ability. I know everybody out there is thinking, I wish those were all my problems, right? I'm just really clever. I'm really quick. I've got an excellent intellect. We can take pride in things about who we are, our accomplishments. I come from a great family, successful career. Wealth, power, influence. You know, some of these things are probably what the young man was struggling with. Other ones, my giftedness, it makes me an exception. Have you ever heard anybody say, you know what, the Lord is just a crutch? Because they're so strong in themselves. It's like, man, why would I need him? I mean, why would I need all this help? Because I'm so successful. I'm really good at this. I'm really talented with that. If you've ever done anything in your own talents, and you're like, man, that was really great. 
it's real easy to think, wow, I did a good job, you know, and really allow that to become kind of your thing. My moral goodness makes me an exception. I've never messed up. I've consistently made good choices, kind of like this young man that's followed the commandments since he was young. I usually find the moral high ground. My performance is better than most. The young ruler may have had issues related to all these areas, making him feel like he was an exception to the kingdom. And he wasn't willing to trust God with his ambitions. He walked away with his talents. And here's what I want you to hear, is that when you just trust yourself with what you want to do, who out here has goals? Okay, like everybody, okay? You have goals, but I'll tell you what. When God gets involved in those goals, watch what happens. It's absolutely amazing. You know what you might want to do in this world. And so the question is, are you willing to trust God with your dreams, your ambitions? Will you trust him with those things? C.S. Lewis once said, when you walk out of his will, when whatever you're doing, these dreams, when you walk out of his will, you basically walk into nowhere. You know, and Jesus once said this about the Holy Spirit. He likened him to the wind, right? That's kind of an interesting way to liken God. But basically, he said, you don't know which way he goes. Have any of you ever gone against the wind? You ever tried to run like against the wind, walk against the wind, or try to live life against the wind of God's spirit? It's misery. But what happens when you get into the wind of the spirit? It's like, wow, you know, <laughs> this is really good. King David said in Psalm 16, he's made known to me the paths of my life, and in his presence is fullness of joy. And he reveals those paths to you. When I was 14 to 21, if I may do a little side story, I thought I wanted to be an actor. I was in the theater, summer stock. I went to college, to the university on scholarship, thought I wanted to be an actor. Fast forward to New York City when I'm 21 years old. I'm finally at a Broadway audition. I walk into the Broadway audition. They called for an Italian-looking guy, thin, 170 pounds. I was a little lighter then. I can't remember. Uh, you know, because they, they can ask for those specific things. It's like the only job in the world where you can discriminate, you know, based on the, the role. So I walk into this audition. As I go into this audition, I walk in. There's like 50 other guys that look like me. I'm not kidding you. I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> the small pond in Kansas, Manhattan, was better than the large pond in Manhattan, New York. There's 50 people that look like me. So as I'm standing in there, I'm telling you, it was the second time the Lord spoke to me. And he said, this is not what I want for you. And I'm at the Broadway audition. I'd spent six years doing theater nonstop. And I go out to, you may be seeing some of these, uh, these uh, relics, payphones. I go out to a payphone. You used to have to put a dime and things like that in there to make a call. I call Cheryl. I use my calling card, no, no change. I use my calling card. By the way, I, I had somebody in Times Square steal my, my calling card numbers once. It was like a $400 bill in one day. But what happened is I call Cheryl, and I say, Cheryl, this is not what God wants for me. And I took the train back to New Jersey, and my whole life changed in so many great ways. I had to trust God with my ambitions and my dreams. And God may ask you to do it. And I'll tell you, I look back now, and I see where God used all those different skills for other reasons. In our last few minutes, verse 26, and those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. These guys now are marveling at the statement that it would actually be easier for a camel to fit in the eye of a needle than for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. I mean, come on. If you heard this for the first time, would you be thinking, how on earth can I make it? I mean, I'm looking to this guy here. He's great. He's good. He gives his money away. He follows the commandments. This guy is excellent. If he can't make it, look at me. I'm messed up. If this guy can't make it to the eye of a needle, you know, I mean, come on. But we all have issues. And God wants to save us all from, them, all from those. Every one of us, no matter how messed up, how sinful we are, 
Jesus just said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Salvation is only possible with God, and it's what he wants for all of you, salvation from the bad things that are keeping you from trusting him. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are a number of things we carry with us that come from a whole different bag of exceptions, and it's not pride exceptions. I'm going I'm to share them with you. And again, when I say exception, I mean things that make us believe we could be an exception to the kingdom of God, the things that are personal, deep, personal things that we can lie to ourselves about, believing that we cannot function like other Christians because of these private issues. In other words, one might think, because my life situation is so different, some truths apply to others, but not me. But that's not true. What God has said he will do, he will do for all mankind. He will do it. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't believe that, believe it. Believe him. Some strongholds of exception, and these are the painful ones. My past. My past makes me an exception to following God, like others that are healthier because I have dysfunctional family or repeated failures or disastrous mistakes or disappointment all the time or despair. My pain makes me an exception because I've been abused or victimized, illness, I'm suffering from injury, loss or grief. My poverty makes me an exception. I'm not talented, like I'm not very smart. Uh, no finances, I'm broke, like no willpower. I struggle with willpower. My poor self-image makes me an exception like to the kingdom of God because I'm never affirmed. I feel rejected by my family. I feel betrayed, abandoned, unloved. And here's what I want to just tell you all. God, again, is a father you can trust. Okay, when you were, when you were young, I'm going to guess if any of you were ever in a in like a Sunday school, the, the story of Jonah is like a favorite, right? And, and, you know, I wanted to share this with you about that particular book. Okay, the whole fish thing is quite interesting. The whole throwing up, you know, Jonah, I mean, you think about that. It's, it's fascinating. There's the veggie tales. There's all these things about it, right? But the thing that I love about it, this is what I want you to hear as far as Jonah's concerned. It's not the fish thing. It's not the throwing up. It's not that the Assyrians, which is fantastic, that they all gave their lives back to the Lord. But do you remember what the prophet told the Lord when he forgave them? This is what he said. He said, you know, I knew this about you. I knew. This is chapter 3. I knew you would forgive them. And the reason he knew, because he didn't want these Assyrians. They were terrible to Israel. He did not want them forgiven. He said, I knew this about you that you would do this, you would forgive them, because you are gracious, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, and you're abounding in loving kindness. He just knew it, because God was that loving. He was a father that was that loving. He is a father you can trust. And as we wrap up in these last few verses, verse 28, then Peter said, see, we have left all, we followed you. So he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come. Peter is really saying, look, we've done everything you've asked. We've followed you. We've trusted you. Will that be enough to be saved? Will we inherit eternal life? They'd given up their careers. They trusted the Lord with everything. They'd lost friends. I'm sure family had turned against them. The family's wondering, what is wrong with all of you? You're giving up all these things to follow this prophet. <clears throat> they completely modified their goals in life, their ambitions to be aligned with God. And Jesus let all of those following him, which is also us, know, you shall receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come when it comes to eternal life. And like Peter, some of you might be thinking after on the edge, when I go home, I want to trust God with some things I've been unwilling to let go of, but it's going to be hard. Or for some of you, you may know that when you leave here, there will be little or no support from your friends. They're going to want you to just go back to living the way you're living, talking about the things you're talking about, doing the things you're doing. You may have family members that don't get this at all, and you don't feel supported. And like Peter and the others, 
And these verses who followed Jesus in a very hostile world, the question is going to be, will you trust God when you're afraid? Will you trust him when you're not accepted by others? Will you really put your trust in him? Because if you will, just watch what happens. Just watch what happens to your life. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not in your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And will you trust God when you feel alone after on the edge? Will you trust him when you feel alone? There will be times when you feel alone, but you're not, okay? You must trust that God is always with you. And the final idea I want to share with you about this aloneness piece, have you, have you felt alone? Have you felt alone in your homes, okay? Maybe you feel alone here, right, at times. And there have been times in life that God is like really silent. And what I'll express to you right now is that, again, from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, you can see God being there when we feel alone. Do you all remember the woman by the name of Hagar? Yeah, so Hagar, Hagar basically is being mistreated by her mistress, Sarah. And when she's mistreated, this, this Sarah's being harsh with her, and she just takes off, okay? And guess what? And this is in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Who goes and finds Hagar? Do you know? It's the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord usually means God himself. And we know by Hagar's words, not all the time, but it usually means God himself. Hagar is out sitting there. What does the angel of the Lord say to her? He says, where are you going? What are you doing? She realized God had came and found her. Like she realized it. So much that she said, I am going to call you a name. And you know what that name meant? I won't try to say the name. But she said, I'm going to call you a name. And it was a name in Hebrew. You are the God who sees me. So God sees you. Like when you're out there, when you're feeling alone. There was a time I was on a trip in Providence, Rhode Island. And as, and as I'm going through a really tough season, okay, a really tough season, I go into my hotel. I traveled nonstop for 10 years. I walk into the hotel, and you know what I say? And I said this out loud as I walked into my courtyard Marriott. It was like my second home for 10 years. I kind of, Jude remembers those years. Chloe caught some of them. I walk into the courtyard Marriott, and as I walk through the doors, I said, out loud, I'm alone. And you know what God told me in my spirit immediately? I didn't hear it audibly, but I heard this. And this is how God talks to us. He, he said to me, you can never say that because you're never alone. Never say that again. And I fell on my knees, and I said, you're right. <laughs> I'm not alone. You are not alone when you go and when you leave and when you're struggling and when you're feeling that way, you have to remember that, okay? Now, I have some more pictures to wrap up this discussion. May I show them to you? So this next one, Calvin, if you'll find it. That is my oldest son. He doesn't look anything like that now. But you might notice the twin towers behind him. So this picture is very special to me for a number of reasons. But when you look at this picture, okay, and you think of what the Twin Towers represents to this day, just the tragedy, the fear, the terror, take a look at that little kid's face and the smile. Do you think he thinks I'm going to drop him? I mean, when you look at I mean, do you think there's any fear in this little baby's face? I mean, he's between these two towers that represent fear and worry now to all of us and the scares of terrorism. That little guy, if you can imagine the Lord holding you, he holds you like that. This is the kind of God you serve. He's like a father. In the next slide, Calvin. A father is someone who lifts you up and holds you there forever. So when you're thinking about your father in heaven, when you're thinking this way, that's like how he is. He's not a judge. He's not out there to, he doesn't want you to lose. He wants you to win. And when you think about this, we'll go back. One more slide, Calvin. On this, a father is someone who lifts you up and holds you there forever. Um, When you think about this, 
a child, again, is trusting. This little girl, and this is not some type of, you know, uh, somebody's not doctored up this photo. I mean, people do this with little kids. Have you ever seen this before? You know, yeah. And, it, and but does a little girl, you think she's scared? No, God has you in this world that we're living in. He's got you, and you have to believe this. And I made a trip to Kenya like two years ago, and I spoke at a school of about 1,000 girls, and there were 700 girls out there. And as I'm talking to these girls, right before I speak to them, the principal comes up to me and she says, Mr. Tony, how can you allow girls to not be boarded in the United States? And I said, what do you mean? I said, they just go to school in the morning. They come home at night. And she said, Tony, I'm asking, how can you let girls go home at night? It's so unsafe. We have to board our girls. In this area that we're in, the girls, it's that unsafe that they have to keep the girls at the school. And then when they do leave for a week or two weeks, guess what they have to do as far as admission back to the school? They have to test for HIV. That's one of the tests. If they have HIV, they're kicked out. That sounds sad, doesn't it? Very heartless. But I say all that to say, as I'm speaking to the girls and I'm talking about the fatherhood of God, and some of you here, let's be frank, some of you here may have fathers that have been pretty lousy. You may have fathers that have hurt you. You have fathers that have, have abused you. I'm going to tell you right now, the exact opposite is our Father in heaven. And when I talked to those girls and I, I told the girls to put your heads down, I said, girls, I just want to know this. How many of you can't relate to the Lord like a dad, like a great father? And about 500 girls put their hands up. They could not get this idea, right? And so I say this to all of you. He's a father you can trust. If you really trust him, you just watch what he'll do. And it's going to be a cool life. And if you go to the last one, this is where Jude makes the, uh, the that's Jude when she was a baby. <laughs> so that's the same guy that was on the racetrack with me earlier, my senior pastor in Kansas City. And down there, assuredly I say to you, you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. I say all this to say, children, children are trusting and they accept freely, accept freely from him and watch what God will do. Um, we are going to have another song, I believe. Is Warren, are you still here? Would you come on up, man? And, and here's what I want to express. Warren will think this is funny. I thought his name was Kid. No, and <laughs> I even got his name wrong. What's your name? Warren. Juan. So I, I like, like John or Luke, or now it's Juan or Luke or Kid. When he came up, I said, hey, how are you doing? I thought you said kid. I'm like, are, and I thought his name was kid, but, but it was Juan, and it wasn't Warren. But, you know, as we spend this time together, as we wrap up together, what I want to say is this, is, and if everyone, would you all just stand together? I want to ask you to do something as we sing this, as we, and, and let's close our eyes as we sing the song. Um, and then I don't know, Aaron, are, will you come up at the end or what? Okay. And so what we'll do is I'll be available for a prayer if anyone just wants to, to pray uh, later. Um, and I'm going to be around the next couple of days. I'm looking forward to it. It's great to meet you all, by the way. And, um, and so uh, when, what we'll do is as we're praying and as we sing this, and close your eyes if you can, you know, just as an act of obedience to the Lord, like if you're wanting to trust him with something, you know, just put your hands out to him or do something. Say something to him as we sing. And I want to pray, Lord, we thank you so much um, for this time together. We thank you for the friendship in the room. And we're just so, just so happy uh, to know that we are your children. And uh, if there's anyone here this morning that um, is not your child, has not, first and foremost, put their belief in you, we just pray, Lord, that you would um, we just right now with them, God, that you would, would just speak to them and encourage them to do that. It would be the best decision they've ever made. Truly the, the single most best decision a man or woman can make in their whole lifetime is to put their faith in you. And so we ask that that would happen right now as we're singing. And then what we also ask is that, you know, just as a, a form of our worship as we're singing, 
um, that we would just offer up anything, any area, any, anything we're holding on to just too tightly uh, that's keeping us from really going after you, pursuing you, and trusting you. We thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. And again, let's sing and, and really just sing to him.